Hi, I'm Ray Dalio, uh, an old friend of the Greenwich Economic Forum. In fact, probably before it was even formed, the idea of it, uh, I was able to be a participant in. So I have a, a deep affection and respect for it. And I really would have loved to be there in Hong Kong with you because uh, that's right at the edge of um, the important American-Chinese relations and what's going on and also is near uh, the other ASEAN countries, which is uh, a very hot place to be. So uh, in any case, I can't make it and I will jump into uh, some of my thoughts. Uh, in history, in my history of playing markets for, oh, I, 50 years or so, some of the times that I was surprised, I was surprised because the things that happened never happened in my lifetime. And when I studied history, I found they happened many times in history. So I studied uh, the Great Depression, 30, 1930 uh, to 45 period. And I, uh, because of that, had a, a systematic way of dealing with the economy when we got into depression type situations, uh, uh, bad situations that helped us a lot in the 2008 financial crisis. And so three important developments are happening now um, at that prompted me to do the study, which uh, led to the book that I wrote, which is Principles for Dealing with the Changing World Order. Um, those three things are an enormous amount of debt creation and the monetization of debt, uh, magnitudes uh, not reached except for the 1930 to 45 period. Um, also, internal conflicts, uh, populism of the left and the right never happened in developed countries when I, uh, through my lifetime, and uh, caused by the largest wealth and values differences, irreconcilable differences, perhaps, that could lead to a type of civil war, uh, a type of civil war, I'm not saying necessarily guns and shooting, uh, but I am saying a type of civil war and, and certainly is leading to uh, great conflict and dysfunction um, in government, not just in the United States, but other places. And the third great influence, of course, is the great power conflict. In other words, uh, through a cycle, there's the rise, uh, there's a war, uh, dominant powers win the war. This was in 1945. Then the new rules of the game are established, particularly by the dominant power being able to establish them. And then um, there's a period of peace of prosperity. And then with time, um, other com countries come along and become competitor, such as China has come along and uh, become a competitor. So um, there are also two other factors that I found. I call these together the big five. The other factor, number four, is uh, acts of nature, droughts, floods, and pandemics have throughout history actually caused more deaths and toppled more orders than the first three that I mentioned. And then throughout history, great technology changes, big changes, such as the industrial revolutions. And of course, we are going through those types of changes with AI and other forms of technology changes that are having and will have revolutionary effects. So I call that, you know, the big five. Before I get into the big five and share my thoughts, what I'd like to do is share with you a clip from uh, the video I did called The Changing World Order. It's about a 40-minute video. What I want to show you is four minutes of that video to give you an idea of what the cycle uh, looks like that repeats over time. And by the way, when I say a cycle, I don't mean anything's predestined to operate in a cycle, but there are cause-effect relationships uh, like any uh, cycle, um, and there are measures of health. And those measures can be uh, seen and measured and anticipated to help to take a view of the future. So I want to show you the pattern that I've seen by studying the last 500 years of history, which is covered in my book, Principles for Dealing with the changing world order. So I'll take uh, four minutes of your time to show you the animation.
I studied the 10 most powerful empires over the last 500 years and the last three reserve currencies. It took me through the rise and decline of the Dutch Empire and the Gilder, the British Empire and the Pound, the rise and early decline in the United States Empire and the Dollar, and the decline and rise of the Chinese Empire and its currencies, as well as the rise and decline of the Spanish, German, French, Indian, Japanese, Russian, and Ottoman empires, along with their significant conflicts, as measured in this chart. To understand China's patterns better, I also studied the rise and fall of Chinese dynasties and their monies back to the year 600. Because looking at all these measures at once can be confusing, I'll focus on the four most important ones, the Dutch, British, US, and Chinese. You'll quickly notice the pattern. Now let's simplify the form a bit. As you can see, they transpired in overlapping cycles that lasted about 250 years, with 10 to 20 year transition periods between them. Typically, these transitions have been periods of great conflict because leading powers don't decline without a fight. So how am I measuring an empire's power? In this study, I used eight metrics. Each country's measure of total power is derived by averaging them together. They are education, inventiveness and technology development, competitiveness in global markets, economic output, share of world trade, military strength, the power of their financial center for capital markets, and the strength of their currency as a reserve currency. Because these powers are measurable, we can see how strong each country is now, was in the past, and whether they're rising or declining. By examining the sequences from many countries, we can see how a typical cycle transpires. And because the wiggles can be confusing, we can simplify it a bit to focus on the pattern of cause-effect relationships that drive the rise and decline of a typical empire. As you can see, better education typically leads to increased innovation and technology development, and with a lag, the establishment of the currency as a reserve currency. You can also see that these forces then declined in a similar order, reinforcing each other's decline. Let's now look at the typical sequence of events going on inside a country that produces these rises and declines. In a nutshell, the big cycle typically begins after a major conflict, often a war, establishes the new leading power and the new world order. Because no one wants to challenge this power, a period of peace and prosperity typically follows. As people get used to this peace and prosperity, they increasingly bet on it continuing. They borrow money to do that, which eventually leads to a financial bubble. The empire's share of trade grows, and when most transactions are conducted in its currency, it becomes a reserve currency, which leads to even more borrowing. At the same time, this increased prosperity distributes wealth unevenly, so the wealth gap typically grows between the rich haves and the poor have-nots. Eventually, the financial bubble bursts, which leads to the printing of money, an increased internal conflict between the rich and the poor, which leads to some form of revolution to redistribute wealth. This can happen peacefully, or as a civil war. While the empire struggles with this internal conflict, its power diminishes relative to external rival powers on the rise. When a new rising power gets strong enough to compete with the dominant power that is having domestic breakdowns, external conflicts, most typically wars, take place. Out of these internal and external wars come new winners and losers. Then the winners get together to create the new world order. And the cycle begins again. 
So that's a, that's a typical cycle, and you have to watch it and uh, you know, give um, whatever thought and credence to that that you think is appropriate. Um, but let me touch on the big five. Uh, by my calculations and understanding the mechanics of the creation of debt, the creation of debt for individuals or companies and governments uh, is all the same except for one big difference in which that is the government's ability to print money to pay debt. In other words, debt is an obligation to pay back money. And if that system works well, there's um, a, a reward. Interest rates are high enough to be good for the lender um, and who becomes the creditor that lender creditor can have a high enough interest rate that they get a good return from that lending and that the borrower doesn't have such a high interest rate that that is um, uh, crushing for them financially. And the more debt rises relative to income, the more difficult that is. So the debts that have been accumulated and large debts are projected, particularly in the United States, but it's, this is now a world phenomenon, um, uh, there's simply not enough money to go around. So for all the social programs, military, and other things, there is, therefore, the progression of debt continuing to rise relative to incomes, which is setting itself up for um, a challenge. Um, central banks, by buying the debt, have taken on their balance sheets. And so that is a risky situation, um, which w uh, evolves over time. It's not the most immediate situation, but it'll certainly be um, affected by the other things that are going on. All of five of these, by the way, affect each other. So the interrelationship in creating that cycle is important. Okay, the second is the internal conflict. And, and of course, that is uh, the highlight of this year. Um, the, you know, how will particularly the elections in the United States go? Um, you know, there are two questions related to that. Uh, will the elections be accepted by both sides? And uh, what are the consequences of that? Um, we honestly don't know the answer. I am, there are reasons for concern, and um, I'll leave that to you. Uh, but uh, there are also very big differences between the policies of uh, what would be a Trump administration and what would be a Democratic administration, um, uh, particularly uh, the issue of um, uh, uh, left-right. Both parties have moderates and have extremists, and in both cases um, there will be likely conflict between the extremists. And so um, in, the, in the Trump presidency, you're getting much more of a... Um, uh, nationalistic, isolationist, uh, protectionist type of policies that are of the right and are likely to offer more protections to, um, to those who um, have larger amounts of money, come, the wealthy and, and the um, corporations. And of course, on the left, most of those uh, policies are somewhat different, but the one thing that there's broad agreement on is the, um, is the um, I would say, anti-China policies. So uh, that brings us, um, so in 2024, uh, we are going to learn a lot about these and what the policies will be. The second, um, uh, uh, the third influence, excuse me, of the great power conflict is something that you all are, see up close. And, um, and both countries, the United States and China, have their own sets of challenges. Uh, in China's case, um, there is, a, um, of course, the real estate uh, creating the, uh, the debt issues and the economic issues coming from that. Um, and as President Xi said, um, there's an approaching one in a hundred year storm on the horizon. And there are um, uh, uh, domestic issues. Uh, climate, of course, is a big issue, has always been for China. 
and um, there are those financial issues and um, taking more of a top-down, um, more autocratic type of approach to uh, consolidating the power and operating from uh, the top. And then, of course, in the United States, we have the uh, internal conflict and the problems we just spoke about. And, of course, that has enormous implications for uh, the world. Um, because if you read history, you see that the economic warfare uh, precedes military warfare. I, I can't comment. I have no particular inside information regarding military conflict. You all see the situation. I uh, believe it's most likely that there's not an imminent um, uh, form of military conflict. Uh, but we do have a situation, of course, with Taiwan that there is a one-China policy, and that, is, uh, and that will not go on forever. And so that uh, has created a set of circumstances now in which um, uh, there's, there are questions. There are questions uh, from international investors about whether they will um, experience consequences that could come from their governments. For example, American investors investing in China could experience from their government um, negative consequences for that. And then there's also um, the worry from um, uh, that the Chinese side could make that uh, uh, challenging. And um, then there's the um, raising of issues of the ideological issues. Let's, let's say, um, uh, is in, in China, is it, is it still glorious to be rich? Um, is it, um, what does uh, the continuation of um, market economy, how is that going to work? Uh, and how uh, does property uh, protections work and how are uh, the issues about uh, um, uh, common prosperity. What does that all? Uh, what, what does that all look like? And so um, that's an evolutionary uh, set of circumstances which you're exposed to and creates uh, uh, risks and issues and even capital flows um, that change the world landscape. For example. Um, um, Chinese producers uh, producing outside of China, and not only in the ASEAN countries like Vietnam and the like, but also in countries like Mexico. Uh, and how does that all work? That's changing the landscape. And of course, there's a great risk of economic sanctions, an exchange of economic sanctions that would be uh, really terrible uh, for the world. So there's risks behind that. At the same time, um, Chinese assets are uh, very attractively uh, priced. And um, uh, we've done very well, Bridgewater has done very well um, uh, over the last uh, five years of operating in there. And so there's certainly effective ways uh, to uh, make investments in China. And then we come to um, the fourth influence, which is um, the climate issue. And there's uh, uh, particularly climate, um, droughts, floods, and pandemics, which have been incredibly deterministic and influential in China. Um, and um, so um, at a minimum, this is going to be very financially costly in one way or another, either to try to keep climate um, temperature levels rising to one and a half degrees and inventing new technologies, or paying the, uh, for the damages that, that, that occur from it, or building infrastructure to protect oneself around that, seawalls and, and, so, and, and other things. Uh, it costs about, estimated cost, $8 trillion a year. That $8 trillion a year uh, worldwide is equivalent to about 8% of world GDP. It's certainly going to be a disruptor, and it'll change migration patterns, and it'll have big, big effects. And, of course, number five, as I said, was technology. And um, what I, in my opinion, 
uh, we are going right now through the greatest uh, industrial revolution changes. You know, and when I look at history, and I think the power of the printing press um, in being able to have knowledge pass, um, and when knowledge could be built on and shared, what an incredible invention. And then, of course, we went from the agricultural age to the industrial age in which we, we learned, man learned, that machines could replace people doing a lot of different things. And that created, a, a, of course, a, a great economic uh, a boom. And, of course, uh, we have had uh, the digital revolution that's uh, gone on that's included uh, all that, you know, uh, uh, all the all its various ways that you're well acquainted with, and of course, uh, this technology revolution, um, AI. When you start to think, thinking touches everything, and the capacity to either supplement one's thinking, or to um, uh, do work that could have been uh, uh, less effectively do, done at more costs by people and the productivity impact, but also technology, uh, this it, it could be used for war. Um, it, it's a, a, a fabulous uh, tool and it, we're entering an era that we really can't fully anticipate. So those five forces are interdependent on, uh, on each other and will influence, but it's a period that we're entering into of, um, uh, uh, of greater risk and the, the main thing I would emphasize is the, um, is the need for effective uh, diversification. So if I was to leave you with some messages, the messages um, would be um, that the power of diversification is greater than the power of even uh, good decision making because you can improve your return to risk ratio by a factor of five if you can find good uncorrelated return streams. And when we think about diversification, diversification means um, uh, diversification of uh, countries, uh, diversification of asset classes, uh, diversification of currencies, um, and so broader diversification. Um, I can't take the time to take you through really the structural ways of being able to diversify well. But I would also emphasize some big picture uh, tactical considerations. Um, basically, there are three things that I look for um, in countries. And I, I suppose to some extent I look for it also in uh, corporations, uh, countries, and people in terms of managing their finances. and um, and. So here they are. Uh, first, um, does the country as a whole earn more than it spends? So does it have a good income statement and a balance sheet so that it is, has the financial capabilities of dealing with the issues at hand? Uh, the second, um, is, is it an environment that is conducive for healthy competition and working together to create great productivity through great leadership and great productivity. And number three, is it a country that is at risk of a war, uh, to be caught between countries in a war? You know, I studied markets, behavior, and wars, and I, there are three types of countries. Those countries that are the winners, those that are the losers in the war, and those that are neutral in the war. And it turns out that those that are neutral in the war do better than the winners of the war, who still pay a terrible cost financially as well as in loss of life and destruction. And then, of course, um, the worst is the losers of the war who lose everything. My main point is that in thinking about what is the financial health of a country, what, how well do they work together to be productive together, and are they at risk of... of um, a conflict that would be disruptive to all of that. So that's what I look at when I'm uh, thinking about diversification. I think about diversification of asset classes. Um, and I would say a couple of things. Um, I, um, I am worried about debt assets being able to provide an adequate return. 
Uh, there has been a big monetization of debt, so now central banks all own a lot of those debts. They have losses on those debts. Um, if things continue, uh, then they will have to monetize even their losses. And that's a, a, a classic late cycle uh, inflationary um, consequence. Um, and in addition, one man's debts are another man's assets. Right now, um, there's a need for about a 2% real return. That's a good guideline of an indifference point. 2% real return is required in order to ha have an equilibrium. And so watch that real return um, to see is if it's maintained and if that could be maintained without um, uh, the, the, the debt squeeze um, happening. So uh, for those reasons, I don't like uh, debt assets. I like um, uh, equity assets. And I think that gold should be part of the portfolio. Um, gold is an alternative money. In fact, it is the third largest reserve currency after the dollar um, and the euro and ahead of the yen. So I would uh, diversify and pay attention to those. Those are my general thoughts. Those factors uh, will be uh, drivers. Uh, and um, I think that uh, the important thing, most again to repeat, is to um, diversify well and in uh, good environments uh, that will are suitable for productivity um, which are many of the new neutral states. Um, for example, the ASEAN countries, um, India, um, even the Gulf countries, um, which I've, um, uh, you know, there's the Middle East in war, but for many reasons, there's reasons to believe that they're not likely to get involved, but, you know, everything is an uncertainty. Uh, but, um, and there's uh, productivity there. So, thinking about the geographic, of course, you will continue to invest in the United States. When I think about uh, diversification, also of new technologies, which I, I think are going to be revolutionary in their impact, um, there is only the United States and China in terms of the big players in this. So um, I think that diversification and investing in China uh, is a desirable amount, uh, is a desirable investment. Uh, but like some of the other measures that met, uh, investments I'm referring to, like gold and the like, I think you have to pay attention to the quantities that you have in each one of those locations to spread them out. So again, you know, I, uh, maybe that's 10% in each one of those and picking fairly uncorrelated um, investments. So that's it in a nutshell. Again, sorry I couldn't be with you and take your direct questions, and, but anyway, I'm sure you'll have a, a great conference because they always put on a great conference. All the best.